Okay, so we can see in here, we've got three uh, colour codes now for post-September, post-February the 22nd, and in blue there, post-June uh, 13th. Um, the, there's an interesting lineation, uh, sorry if I could point at the board here, interesting lineation going, going in this direction for June 13th. Everybody will know that a lot of the aftershocks trended off towards uh, Akira as well. Um, but there was a significant aftershock from, well aftershock or an earthquake that came after June 13, which was back out here in the Hallswell area too, and that was really quite strongly felt. That, was, that earthquake there was the strongest uh, locally felt earthquake of the whole sequence. Um, so sometimes these relatively small, magnitude 5, 5.5, but uh, locally felt quite shallow and that did some damage there I think in one of the um, supermarkets that had remained open through every other event. So, um, okay, so this is just the, the, the week, the June 13th and the week following. Uh, the, it's the epicentre down there almost close on this end of Brighton, Brighton Spit as an epicentre uh, down at about uh, 6 kilometres or so. And this is this cluster that occurred out here post that period as well. So things are moving around still a little bit. Uh, in terms of June 13th, for a long time there was some discussion that oh, it's probably parallel to February 22nd and sitting just in behind it a little bit. That would be, this is a model coming from all of the continuous GPS sites around the area and showing the directions of movement of the GPS stations. The uh, blue uh, lines here are the obser observed lines, and if you put a fault line in there like that, it's, that's the model of what that would do, and you can see in here that there's some really big discrepancies. The alternative, and there always is these two alternatives when you have a um, uh, um, solution from an earthquake, it could uh, often has these cross uh, lines, what we sort of see as beach balls, so the movement could be in that direction or the movement could be in that direction. And this is setting up and looking at the option that the fault line was in fact uh, northwest southeast or north northwest south southeast trending. And again, you'll see there the observed um, motions from the GPS stations. And you see now the red ones, they fit much better to the observed than, does, the, uh, than does, does this model here. So it does look, and it's still preliminary, there's still information being collected, uh, in particular from the satellites that are going past looking at the, that the changes, that the fault line was um, this uh, north, northwest, south, southeast trend, which was surprising. Um, we don't know if earthquake orientation, uh, fault line orientations like that has a significant structural trend in the region. Um, and we, uh, but nevertheless, that uh, seems to be how it is. Now, the magnitude there is, it is, I'll talk about in a moment, this is a little bit, is magnitude six. So we're starting to look at, you know, relatively modest sized, sized earthquakes. Um, this is a little bit about the ground motion, the, the ground shaking in the city. Um, here plotting um, the vertical ground motions from February the 22nd in red. Um, and we see through various parts of the uh, city, uh, Halberstone, uh, Pages Road would be there for example. So some of these city sites, these tended to be the eastern suburbs of the city. Very, very high ground motions in February the 22nd. By comparison in both the vertical motions and the horizontal motions, uh, June 13th was smaller, had lesser, uh, lesser shaking, lesser ground motions. So I think that's coming through in the buildings. Interestingly, the uh, commentary from in terms of ground deformation, uh, especially in the eastern suburbs, because of the subsidence that had occurred prior, the the liquefaction that occurred on June 13th was just as bad as February the 22nd, even if the ground shaking was a little bit lower. Possibly because the water table's higher, relatively speaking, or the ground is lower, whichever way. So the susceptibility to liquefaction um, is, you know, in some senses, increasing in time. 
Uh, this is another more regional plot. Locally, of course, the out at Sunma Head, which is just about sitting on top of the uh, epicenter, that had huge horizontal ground motions, more than two times the force of gravity. So they were, they were astronomical ground motions out there. But in the city, in general, less than February the 22nd. Here's uh, some updates on the, uh, the probabilities that has been widely discussed. This is um, looking ahead for one year, one month, seven days, take your choice, your period of interest. Uh, generally we've been thinking, um, looking ahead for a year is, is the most sensible thing to be doing. If we were starting today, for example, if we start a month from now, uh, if we start two months from now. Just to get an idea about the statistics of this in terms of how they're evolving depending on what happens. Now this number here, the this, uh, the chances of a six plus earthquake in the coming year had gone up to a bit over 30% um, because of the June 13th earthquake. But there's been no further earthquakes of that size and so the chances, the probabilities are dropping away. So for every month that passes that we don't have one of these substantial earthquakes, then on the statistics um, uh, start dropping away. So if we look forward to that uh, if we have no more magnitude 6 plus earthquakes, about 1 in 4 chance now, 1 in 5 chance in a month's time if there are no further 6s and dropping a little bit below that. But um, in contrary to my good friend uh, Ken Ring, the, there will still be further aftershocks. Looking at this number here, the chances still of a magnitude 5 plus it still hangs in there in the coming year as, as a very high likelihood. So we've still got to keep being prepared. We hope that they're not in the really damaging 6 plus range, but almost certainly we will still have earthquakes in the 5 plus range, and we need to be prepared for those. That's great in great Christchurch. That's great, yeah, and yes, that's Why very, that, Canterbury, that's a very good point. I, could, I, should, I should come back and emphasise those numbers apply to this whole aftershock region, not to the city itself. The city itself is probably only, you know, a quarter or a fifth or something of that whole region. So thanks for that clarification, that's really important. So these apply to that whole, that whole region. Somewhere in the region, Yes, most of the uh, activity has been down the city end of things uh, recently, but we saw that that cluster goes back out to Hallswell. Earthquake this morning, uh, 20 kilometres north of Darfield. So they're also happening in the wider region. Then, then the other thing to look to, and so that this could now be a pattern a little bit like the uh, buried fault or the Port Hills fault here. A, June 22nd fault with an orientation a bit like that. So the next thing is to think about, okay, we've, we've been doing these seismic lines to try and understand the fault lines at depth uh, underneath where the seismicity is occurring. Uh, a bit of an update on that uh, in, this, in the area I'll talk to today, particularly out in this area here. We didn't have that information um, um, a, a little while ago. Some of that's come through with some analysis now through our colleagues we've been working with at the University of Calgary. This is the line they want to talk about and it goes, um, it's called Robinson's Road, goes from down here a bit north of uh, Lincoln all the way out across State Highway 1 and out to the West Coast Road. That's designed to go across those clusters of seismicity in the Lincoln area and in the Rolleston area to see what we can see below ground um, associated with those um, structures. So this is quite a long line, this is about 30 kilometres long and so it's very, very exaggerated in terms of, um, but we do see, again this is their favourite reflector, the six million year old uh, top of the uh, Littleton Volcanics as they're buried beneath that area. They do extend all the way out there. A good marker horizon. At the southeastern end of the line, uh, we do see some fault lines. So in this sort of sector here, there are some fault lines that um, can be seen in the subsurface. Also in the middle part of the line um, that goes quite high, 
up through the stratigraphy up to near the surface. This is about six million years. These strata in here are probably in the range of a million years or so. They're not really, really recent, but they give us some feeling about the movement rates over these faults over a very long period of time. And then in the north part, some faults are very old faults, but they don't extend up um, anywhere near the surface. The other piece of information, and this is where things start tying together, if we see these earthquakes down in the, in the Prebleton, Lincoln, Hallswell area, and look at those, if we plot, push those all to a cross-section line through there, we've seen that when we relocate those earthquakes, many of them fall onto a quite a distinct cluster, um, and that's pretty clearly uh, that these these earthquakes, many of these in this region here, are actually being on a reactivation of a fault which is probably fairly steeply dipping like that, that um, those faults are that probably this one here. Okay, so we can pull together what's happened in terms of earthquake in relation to a fault line that's down there at depth. Um, the other thing to see in here, these are approximately 100 metres. These are still very low slip rate faults. This is the d displacement over a period of six million years of a few tens of metres at most. So it's the same story as, as we've found throughout the city. These are very, very low slip rate faults. These are very rare earthquake occurrences. Um, so in the end, I think that that's coming to what we would say. There's still a lot of question marks on these. Um, this is the end of the Greendale Fault. It would appear in this, we have, we have the seismic line that goes across here now. We can see probably an extension of the Greendale Fault going a little bit further than what ruptured in September, but is into this big cloud of um, of aftershock activity essentially at the end of the rupture, which is very consistent. The possibility of a small fault extending north, which we haven't seen very well because of the line that's crossing. This seems very clear that there is a northeast oriented fault line here. Um, there is not a continuation of a fault line through the gap area. This is um, Port Hill's fault may extend a little bit further there, and these would be the small features that we're seeing under the city. So that's, um, that's a sort of a summary of where we've got. I emphasise again that there's lots of question marks on that still. We've endeavoured, uh, a lot of endeavour in this, a lot of work, um, but it's complicated down there, and we still have some of these uncertainties. Uh, complex, uh, the aftershock activity is is uh, complicated in both space and time. Um, there's multiple hidden fault sources down there. They all appear from everything we've seen to have very, very small amounts of displacement over quite a long period of time. It comes back to these being a, an infrequent and very unusual earthquake sequence for Canterbury, but clearly they occur from time to time, time to time meaning thousands of years apart. The Greendale Fault goes across into this big, messy area of aftershocks. Uh, the Greendale Fault might extend a few kilometres further than what we've seen previously, but not very much at all. And then it seems to be truncated by a different orientation of faulting, and so the gap area really is a gap. Um, that east side of that gap area is defined by this north northeast uh, trending zone, Hallswell through to uh, Lincoln. And it's only by integrating all of these pieces of information that we're getting to have some understanding of what goes on down there. In terms of structure, we put the earthquakes that have occurred on it, and then we have some, some um, um, better appreciation of making some sort of forecasts. But the forecasts are not very precise, they're not they're statistical um, numbers, but they're not going to be um, we expect that there to be further earthquakes or no earthquakes on these zones. The, the Hallswell-Lincoln zone, so far the total amount of energy released on that only, is equivalent to less than a magnitude 6 earthquake. So we would still say that unknown, but that could be one of the candidates if there were to be a further magnitude 6 plus earthquake. It could still be out there.